Jews. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Wow, it's great to be here. What a beautiful space. An absolutely beautiful space. Uh, so, uh, as Jenny said, I'm Rich Baranek. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Rice University. Uh, don't shoot the engineer. And uh, what I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about today is, uh, as, as Jenny did extremely clearly in the introduction, talk a little bit about how technology is enabling some really interesting new ways and means to scale up the kind of quality education that goes on at this campus and, and your campuses. And, and think about uh, uh, extending the reach of our uh, educational approaches nationally and, and globally. And I'm going to tell this as a, just a bit of a story with my experience over the last uh, 16 years or so uh, because it's elements that we've uh, had at Rice, namely connections and OpenStax. Hopefully we can keep this also interactive. If people have burning questions, you can just raise your hands and I'll try to stop. Uh, but otherwise, let's jump in. So we're here uh, to talk about this. And, and yes, uh, students at Rice get younger and younger every year. I can't believe it. You probably sense the same thing. And the, the, the story is back in 1999, I was teaching uh, an electric, intro electrical and computer engineering class uh, about this. Right, so that's me, 1999. And what I, what I would notice in my class is exactly what I notice what's going on here, that half of the audience's eyes are slowly starting to glaze over, right? People are going to sleep. Anybody know what this is? Physicists from breakfast? Thank you, Fourier transform. And, and the problem with this is it was to the students, this esoteric mathematics that made them think like, why am I here? Why am I in this class? And certainly, why should I study this thing? Right, this, this formula, this form, mere formula. And I was just very lucky that being at a school like Rice, like a lot of your schools, it's very small. And so I could have only 20 students in my class. And I could find and identify the, st the C students and I could grab them, right, either in office hours or right out of class. And I could talk to them. And I could try to almost do a kind of a psychoanalysis to understand why they wanted to be an engineer in the first place and why they didn't like this and what we could do about it. And what I realized is that I could often connect with them on a, on a very, very deep level because I would realize that they're needing to study this because they're interested in one of these things. It turns out that this formula, this mere boring eyes glazed over formula is just absolutely central to modern technology. I mean, it's how JPEG works in your, your, your camera. It's how we look uh, for oil and gas. It's how radar works, communication, Siri, electronic music. And what I would be able to do is find out the, the, the context and the interest and the goals of the student and then be able to work backwards and connect them into this formula. And after you know, turning a few C students into A students, right, who went on to grad school, literally doing this kind of stuff, I started to think of how I should scale this up, right? How can I do this? Because Rice, I'll, I'll impact 20 kids a year. I'd like to impact, you know, 20,000 or 200,000. And uh, what's the standard thing you do as an academic to scale up, at least in a STEM discipline? What do you do? You do what? You write a book, right? That's what we do. We write books. And there are 175 textbooks that taught this exact same content, none of which taught it the way I wanted to teach it. But I realized that this was going to be a fruitless kind of enterprise. And so instead, I started to take a look at, 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 at why people get frustrated, pe like me get frustrated, why we think about writing a book, and whether there's a different way that we can think of getting those educational ideas out. And I soon realized that we were in a world of uh, a factory mentality of education, right? Where we basically pump in matriculants at one end, right? And graduates come out the other end. And what I wanted to do was move much to more a world like an ecosystem with a tremendous diversity of different educational ideas, talking about the Fourier transform from nine different angles, uh, and allowing a, a, not just my educational ideas to be used in my class or the author of a book, but potentially a large community of experts from around the world. And so we set out uh, to do this. This is back in 1999. And the, the model that we, we fell upon was the idea of using a network 
right? Uh, uh, in a network in, in two ways. First, uh, they're to realize that knowledge forms networks, that ideas are connected in very interesting, nonlinear, and somehow are often surprising ways. And it's precisely those interconnections between ideas that really excite students, right? Uh, so that's, that's part one. And part two is realizing that networks of people provide really efficient new ways and means to develop knowledge and to, to, to share it with, with the world. And so uh, uh, we were extremely interested in Linux and open source software. Show of hands, open source. Okay, and so we, we at, it, back then we realized we should pursue an open approach, an open standards approach to developing and, and sharing knowledge. And this initial frustration with my class has led me on to this 16-year kind of odyssey uh, around trying to develop systems to, to improve and scale up uh, knowledge. So the first thing that we uh, decided to do, remember I was thinking about writing a textbook, was to think of how we could do a network textbook, a different kind of textbook. And so the first thing we thought about was, well, let's, let's take these, uh, the ideas in this book, which are linearized, right, printed on paper, glued together, right, uh, and give students a one particular static linearized view of the world. And let's think of liberating these ideas. So let's cut all the pages out of the book. Right? And let's throw all those pages, maybe make each into a little Lego block, and let's put them in a big repository. So here's my repository of Lego blocks. Looks like chaos, right? Okay, it looks like chaos, but of course we know that, that we can use powerful technologies that even were available back then, the web, XML, databases, et cetera, et cetera, to, to enable uh, uh, instructors anywhere in the world to be able to take these Legos and build really powerful learning machines. Right? Learning machines that can be built quickly, can be reconfigured quickly, that if a, student, if a faculty uh, at, at UT Austin doesn't like my book from Rice, they can pull off some blocks, put some new blocks on. And then I think the most radical idea was the idea to make these open source and free. So completely free and completely open source. And by open source, uh, I mean the idea of using licenses like the Creative Commons license, show of hands. I used to have a whole slide about it, but now everybody knows about it. Uh, basically, a license that enables anyone in the world to take the content, innovate on it, improve it, change it, make a new version, share it in different ways, in some cases even, even commercially. And so this was the, the basic idea. And then over the course of uh, uh, about five years, uh, uh, helped by a number of different foundations, we were able to build a system called Connections. And as a, again, uh, as an engineer, uh, taking a very engineering kind of approach to explaining this, you, know, you, you think of a, there's a mountain of raw knowledge out there, right? A mountain of raw knowledge at the top. And an, uh, an author community from around the world is continuously mining this mountain of raw knowledge. They're, they're using authoring tools. They're creating little ingots, right? Little Lego blocks that are then put in a, a repository. And, and students and instructors worldwide are, are free to use these little Lego blocks, but they can also sequence them together into these courses and, uh, or books or, or what have you, and then make them available in many, many output formats. So Connection started back in 1999. It's, it's grown over the years. It's still in the top three open education projects around the world, the other two being MIT Open Courseware, that I'm sure you've heard of, and and uh, Khan Academy, right? So, that, so we're the three big, uh, uh, big platforms. And then, but over the years, we realized that we learned a, an important lesson, right? We learned that, that we kind of got the demand side of things right. Namely, there's a lot of demand for these open educational materials. So the STEM materials in Connections, uh, including my book, I ended up finally writing a book, but I put it in Connections instead of publishing with a publisher, have been used many, many times. So over 130 million uses of our STEM content over even just about the last five years. So we got the demand side right. Uh, but the supply side was the problem. The supply side was convincing people like you that you should contribute your educational ideas. And the reason was more that the barriers were too high as far as the tools. Right? If anybody here who raised their hand about connections had ever tried it. The idea of building these kind of educational Lego blocks sounds really, really simple, but it's, it, it's, it's a little bit more complicated than, than you would like. And so we had this build it and they will come mentality that uh, 
you know, uh, 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 turned out to, to not help us scale as quickly as we wanted on the, on the supply side. So this is really the state of where we were in about 2010, 2011. And, and in, in a sense, we had this platform all ready to go. And we just had to wait for an opportunity. And a new opportunity came our way. And uh, it was, uh, well, actually, just let, let's step back before the, the mentality. Uh, basically, what we found, uh, show of hands, Jeffrey Moore is crossing the chasm. I might not, maybe you don't know that. OK. So when you think of moving a new idea or technology into a space, people tend to think of a bell curve of uh, distribution of adopters. And there's early adopters and visionaries at the left hand and all the laggards and skeptics at the other end. Usually people have a naive idea that you can introduce a technology with these visionaries and, and early adopters and then just flow it through the main population. Okay, the problem is that does not work, as, as many of you probably now know uh, or have experience with, not, uh, nodding your heads. There's in fact a massive chasm between the visionaries and everybody else. And this is where technology usually tends to get stuck. And this is exactly what happened with connections, right? Uh, think of the iPad. Everybody has an iPad today. But what did we have about 10 or 15 years ago? We had the Newton. What happened with the Newton? Caught on in the far left, but it never crossed over the chasm, right? Never crossed over there. How much, show of hands, how many people remember the Apple Newton? Right? A lot of you might not. Okay. So we had this chasm problem and we had to wait for some kind of opportunity and it really hit starting in about uh, 2011 and that was the realization that, that the whole economics of the educational publishing world were becoming completely bizarre. Okay, so this is a fantastic curve that shows the, 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 the growth over time of the cost of a number of key uh, indicators in the economy. So the, the, the dark red line, this is the consumer price index from about 1977 until now. Uh, new home prices grew rapidly, 300% over that period, right? Healthcare, everybody knows that medical equipment went through the roof, right? It's terrible, it's a travesty, right? That's the red curve. But look at the blue curve, that's textbooks. Okay, that's educational materials have risen over the last, since 1977, 812%, okay? I don't know how many, there were some physicists at breakfast, Okay, this is the market leading uh, physics textbook. It is not unheard of to have a $350 book. Okay, $350 book. And the, the, one of the issues here is that the faculty, uh, at least back in 2010, didn't realize the prices were creeping up because when the publisher representatives come visit you in your office, do they ever mention the price of the book? They never mention the price. Right? So, so this is a problem and, and it's become a crisis, student debt in this country, $1.2 trillion. And what we were starting to realize back in 2010, 2011, is that students, because of this high price, are just not buying books anymore. Right? They're not. I don't know what you notice in your, in your classes, especially in STEM, but it's particularly in community college, th these are some statistics from a recent survey, 70% of college students are not buying the textbook. They know they're not going to perform as well in the class because of that, and they're taking fewer credit hours because of the expense. And this is not quite as big of an issue at a school like Rice, right, which where the tuition is large. Uh, but at a school like uh, Community College, this is an absolute, uh, 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 absolute crisis. And in particular in schools in California where the community college tuition has tried to, the government tries to push it as low as possible. For the average student in California now, the cost of community college tuition is 50% and the other 50% is the cost of books. Right, so half of this debt uh, is, is debt load in California is caused by textbooks. So we realized we should do something about this. And we had the platform, but what we needed to do was to somehow get physics professors, chemistry professors, psychology professors, to switch over to using the, these kind of open educational resources. And we realized that a build it and they will come mentality would not work. And so we had to change our approach. And we had to pivot and actually become a publisher. And so in, in 2011, we, we launched a, a project we call OpenStax, OpenStax College in particular. And the idea was to develop a library of, of books primarily for uh, uh, the introductory, big introductory classes at schools all around the country, community colleges and, and uh, universities. 
So these would be all the big high enrollment courses. And the really neat thing about a library of 25 books is that it covers literally 50% of all college enrollments. Okay, it's amazing uh, that so few books, right? You think of the zip distribution, right? There are a lot of energy or a lot of people at that, the head end of that tail. So, so this is a project that we launched based uh, on some, as I'll talk about in a minute, some venture philanthropic uh, uh, funding. So the, the key thing was that we uh, uh, wanted to make, in order to convince physics, chemistry, psychology professors to switch, we knew we couldn't just come in with something sort of that was open and that was kind of minimalist. We needed to come in with something that was really on par with what the publishers offered. So we embarked on a very aggressive program to develop extremely high quality, peer reviewed, professionally authored books. Right? So these are developed by the same authoring type of teams and go through the same kind of quality control mechanisms as the, the, the regular publishers. They're, they're turnkey adoptable, so and they have everything you need. The power book for their class. They might like our biology book, but they want to take something out, right? Uh, maybe evolution, I don't know. No, <laughs> they don't. They don't want to take out evolution. Uh, and uh, or, or they might want to put in some other some other ideas. So there are over 170 customized versions of our books, and we we're really excited about this because it really indicates how there's a community uh, uh, developing around the books uh, that is repurposing to use them in, in different uh, different uh, situations. We also have, if you think of errata in books, how long does it take to get errata fixed? It take years, okay? So we basically e exploit, again, a community of authors, students, grad students around the country who when they spot an error in one of our books, they actually use a bug tracking system just like you would use if you built a software system. We call it the Stacks Dash. And we're able to fix some of these errata, these problems within two days, right? So we identify that it's a problem, it goes back to the authors, that the, the, there's a peer, quick peer review to make sure that the, the change is correct and the digital version of the book is literally updated within days. So we're just really excited about this for really fast moving areas of uh, you know, science and, and, and technology. The other thing that distinguishes this as far as scaling up from other kind of open and free educational projects is that we actually embrace per participation of the for-profit sector. So if you think uh, to the Lennox uh, operating system, show of hands, Lennox, okay? So your campus, right, probably has Lennox. Do they actually install it? The, uh, do the IT people install it themselves from the internet? What do they probably do? They actually buy it. They buy it from a company like Red Hat, okay? So actually pay money for something free. Does anybody know why you would do that? Why? You get help, right? You get a 1-800 number if it's not installing correct. You get a nice flashy DVD, right, that to uh, install. You have somebody to blame, right, a contract if it doesn't, doesn't go well, right? So, so in a very similar way, we're working with uh, uh, 30 plus companies, both nonprofits and for-profits, who are basically bundling services around our free and open books in order to add extra value to the student experience. And a great example of this is computer-based homework. And I bet a lot, uh, how many people here know about computer-based homework? Okay, it's, 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 it's very important in really big, especially state schools, in STEM disciplines where you have 600 people in a class, grading becomes unscalable. Increasingly, faculty are moving to web-based systems, right, where students do their homework online, it's automatically graded, and they're able to get, they're able to get feedback. So there are three major uh, uh, computer-based homework folks who are working with us, Wiley, which has the Wiley Plus system, Sapling Learning and WebAssign. And the idea is that they actually market our books when they come visit faculty around the country. And they say, uh, 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 instead of having your students subscribe to our system and then pay for a $300 book, the student could subscribe to our system at a reduced cost and have a zero dollar book, right? So it's a pretty compelling, uh, pretty compelling argument. And the, the, the thing that is uh, attractive for us in working with these companies is that then there's a revenue return from subscription sales on these computer-based homework subscriptions back to the project to, to, to sustain it long term. Because of course, long term, we can't live off foundation funding. We just need to be sort of uh, 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 established with foundation funding. Just a, one last quick story. Wiley uh, was thinking about bi uh, biology, realized they had no viable biology textbook, 
And so they were faced with uh, three choices, either abandon biology as a market to publish in, write a new book, which would cost them about $5 million, or use our book. And so Wiley actually markets the OpenStax College bio book as their biology textbook. So quite, quite uh, fun. Okay, uh, and there's a number of other resellers, college stores, uh, iBook versions, uh, et cetera. So, so let's kind of come back to the original vision and, 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 and talk a little bit more about how we can take these books, which what we're talking about right now is up to now is just doing the same thing more efficiently, right? Same old book, but free, right? So now let's come back to how we can really try to excite and, and, and connect uh, the, the educational experience for each student back into their, their context. And let me ask Jenny a quick question. How am I doing on time? You are doing great, it's not here. Okay, perfect. So let's talk a little bit about, about you know, tools that we can use to, to, to personalize the educational experience. Because of course, if every kid is different, every kid should have their own learning experience. Or with the book metaphor, every kid should have their own book, right? Because they're different. They have different goals, different backgrounds. So the question is, how do we do this? How do we figure out who these people are, what they're interested in, and then how do we customize their educational experience? And, and the, the, the key has to be, if we're going to scale this up, has to be to do, use some kind of technology, right? So we're going to talk about technology for education, right? Uh, which has always been coming to our rescue, right? Technology comes to the rescue. And uh, this is where mo you know, half the audience rolls their eyes because technology has been coming to the rescue for a long time. There's a bubble, right? A $1.3 billion uh, investment last year in ed tech. Uh, this it seems like every 10 years there's a, there's a, a bubble in uh, educational technology. Uh, but there have been bubbles going back to the beginning of, of technology. So I love this quote from Thomas Edison. Uh, the, you know, the film projector was supposed to revolutionize education. If, if, if any of you are old enough, even I remember, the TV was gonna revolutionize education. We'll just put all the best lecturers, right, on TV, and that will solve all of our problems, right? Uh, so the, uh, the, 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 the main question I have for you to think about is, what is different today that is different than these kind of technologies? Because I'd argue there is a real difference today as opposed to these technologies. And the difference is, is that these old technologies are broadcast technologies that broadcast one view, right? A book, a TV program, a radio program to a mass audience, okay? And so there's no opportunity in a broadcast medium with any kind of customization or personalization. Okay, the difference with computers and the thing that makes computer-based education completely different from these kinds of education, if done properly, is that we can get data, right? We can get data about what people are doing while they're watching or, or interacting with these digital learning experiences. And we can use that data to close the learning feedback loop. Okay, you can't do that with television, right? But you can with a computer-mediated uh, uh, experience. So, so the thing that I'd like to talk about for the next few minutes is, is some of the ideas we've been working towards at Rice towards doing interesting things with educational data and how we're working to, to close, this, uh, close this learning feedback loop. So here's our basic model, the way, we like to, the way we like to think of things. And I should warn you that my day job at Rice is machine learning. So hopefully I won't go off too far into uh, into, into that. But the, the basic idea is a student is, is interacting with some kind of device, some kind of digital device, and as they're interacting with that device, reading, watching videos, interacting with simulations, solving problems, doing their homework, we can get data, right? Lots and lots and lots of data uh, about their experience, and we can process that data through machine learning algorithms. These sound like kind of uh, uh, I don't know, they sound kind of uh, maybe uh, 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 mumbo-jumbo-ish, but this is the kind of, everybody's actually familiar with machine learning algorithms because these are the things that every time you go to Netflix or Amazon and they suggest a movie you would like to watch or a book you would like to read, these are the kind of sophisticated computer algorithms that are running in the background to do this, to basically figure out your 
profile, if you will, figure out how it, how you can, it links to other users' profiles and how you can leverage that information about each other to make recommendations or suggestions, similar with Google. So the big difference here, though, is that we don't want to do this just Amazon or Google style. We need the machine learning algorithms to have models of how people think built in, right? How, how people learn, how people forget, right? And how best to, to process information or present it so that it's maximally or, or optimally transferred, right, into our, into our brains and, and stays there. So we're very interested in, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more later about some of these algorithms. So given that we have a lot of data and we can process this data, we can do a bunch of different things as far as closing the feedback loop. First, we can give feedback to the student, right? We can tell the student, here's how you're doing not only on this problem, but on the whole course, right? Here's your, uh, for example, here's your projected grade on the final exam if you weren't going to do any more studying. If you were going to study some more, here's some areas that you might want to study, right? Uh, we can give analytics to the instructor so that the teacher knows, the faculty member knows how every student is doing, who's stuck, where they're stuck, whether you should intervene, email them to come into office hours, right, etc. So, so the instructors ha can, can teach more uh, effectively. And finally, the, in a sense, the holy grail is to give the student a personalized next task so that every student in a class has some algorithms analyzing what's going on in the background and the next thing that they're going to do is optimized for their experience, right? To both keep them excited about the course and help them, uh, help them, help them learn that material more effectively. So these are the basic uh, uh, ideas and, 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 and applications, if you will, that we're uh, exploring at Rice. And let's just look at, at, at just some glimpses of, of some of the things that you can do uh, with very, very little data, actually. Okay, so this is, this is uh, let's, talk about standard, let's talk about standard practice of technology for education. It's called Microsoft Excel, right? You have a spreadsheet, right? And uh, students go this way and problems go this way, right? Uh, and you basically put numbers in the cells, right? Depending on how, whether the student got a problem correct or incorrect. Right, that's uh, very handy. What do we do at the end of the year? Well, we just take a, a row and we basically sum up. We do some weighted sum and we get a number and that's either that number is the grade or we quantize to A, B, C, D, F uh, and that's the grade, right? This is standard practice of technology for education. So we were very interested to just think about if we were to take uh, machine learning algorithms and apply it to data just like this. Okay, so student grade or, or faculty grade book data where, uh, again, students, uh, uh, we have students, we have problems. We're not even marking in the partial credit. We're just marking whether a given student got a given question correct or incorrect. And we're also even allowing for students to not do some problems. So gray in this case would be an example of where a student hasn't solved a given problem. And now you, and, and you could think of in a given class, you might have 25 students. You might have uh, in a STEM class 100 problems. You could also imagine in larger scale uh, uh, experiments, you might have an entire campus or you might have thousands of students. And, you, and if you look inside a textbook, you might, uh, like a STEM textbook, you might have literally 3,000 problems that, that students could work. So you could imagine very, very large uh, matrices, right? This is what these are, matrices. And we were interested in what we could uh, glean from this uh, information. And so without going into you know, any details, just by looking at this student gradebook data with no additional information, we can organize all of the problems uh, like this. Okay, now this is where your eyes kind of, oh my gosh, he's going to go back to the Fourier transform. So what is this? This is a graph. Each box is a problem. Okay, so each box is one of those problems. The numbers in the boxes are the difficulty of those problems. But now what the machine algorithm has learned is that these problems are actually re related to each other. Right? They're related by some kind of graph structure or a map type structure where you can see that all of these problems somehow relate to some underlying concept, if you will, that the machine understands. Okay. Would we ever show this to teachers or students? 
No, we wouldn't, right? This would be under the hood, right? But just to give you uh, an idea. So, so the, the, the questions, again, are the, these boxes. These yellow circles are, are concepts that are automatically identified, right? This is just like how Netflix figures out that one of you likes romance, karate, uh, movies in Korean, okay? Uh, these are weird kind of uh, genres. That these are not necessarily human interpretable, Right? But we can go mine through the, the, either the, the problem statements or the solutions to the problems and actually pull out keywords. So in this case, we can realize that problem three or uh, concept three has something to do with thermodynamics. Okay? Moreover, in addition to organizing all these problems, now every student, remember the rows were, our columns were problems, rows were student. Every student now gets not just a grade, but a profile. Right? In this case, a set of five numbers that tells us how well Patty, in this case, understands or has demonstrated her knowledge of each of these five concepts. Okay, why is this useful? Well, it's useful for a whole bunch of reasons. First, this is much more useful to her than her B plus grade. You can have a whole bunch of students in a class who get B plus. They all got B plus for different reasons. Right? There's, and there's no actionable information in B plus about what they should do. In this case, Patty knows she's getting a B plus because she's weak on concept three. Right? So what can Patty do? Well, the algorithm can tell her, Patty, you're kind of weak on concept three. How about we go work some problems having to do with concept three? And I'm going to start with easy ones and ramp you up to harder and harder ones. Right? So you, hopefully you can see how under the hood of a, of, of a, of a, a, a sort of friendly looking tutoring type application, you could have some pretty sophisticated uh, uh, machine learning uh, uh, algorithms. Does this make sense to people? Hopefully. Okay, just to give you a taste. Uh, here's another interesting one. Uh, scaling up uh, grading. Does anybody here like grading? Okay, grading's no fun. Right, grading's no fun and so people tend to, they love to go to the web to grade. But what happens when you go to the web to grade? It's awful because you can only do really, really minimalist stuff like multiple choice, right? Uh, 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 true and false, right? Fill in the blank. This is, this is not pedagogically useful, right? You don't want physics students, right? Choosing from multiple choice uh, responses, right? You want them actually working the problems. So let's just talk for a second about uh, some, some work we just kind of think is really interesting around using what's called natural language processing, which you might be familiar with for uh, uh, grading essays, right? Uh, Computer-based algorithms for grading essays can be applied to actually grading, for example, mathematical calculations. So let's say uh, we give this, uh, students this problem, and, and feel free to work it out if you have some paper, right? Find the derivative of, of uh, this function. Uh, and uh, let's say we have uh, you know, a thousand students in a class, right? Some big uh, lecture class. We have a thousand students. Well, without, you know, again, without going into the details, you're going to get a thousand typed in, right? Uh, 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 you know, calculations. And, and what can you do with these calculations? Well, it turns out that you can convert these calculations, like you can uh, convert these numerical expressions essentially into words. Right? words in some new kind of language. And then you can apply what are called clustering techniques where you can cluster together people's solutions that, 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 that share a lot of the similar words, if you will. It's a sort of very high, high level view here. And so you can, these words actually live in a really high dimensional space, not 3D like we live in, but like thousand dimensional space. But it turns out this is an example of one of these clusterings, right? It's shown on a, on, a, on a flat screen. And what you see is that all the correct answers here in red actually cluster together. Well, actually, you see two things. First, you see clusters. Okay, you see clusters, right? Everybody see the clusters? There's a red one. Here's some more red one. Here's a pink one. Okay? You don't know which answers are correct or incorrect. But it turns out in this thousand student course, you will probably see about 10 clusters. So what can we do once we've seen these 10 clusters? A human, either the instructor or the grader, can pull out just a random solution from those 10 clusters and grade that solution. And that human grader who only has to grade 10 solutions will realize, well, these are correct. These are not correct. Okay, now what can we do? We can assign that same grade, right, partial credit grade, to all of the students in that 
those respective clusters and basically scale up right their grading all they have to do is 10 problems graded and they can apply these grades to thousands they never need to grade this problem ever again because students in the future are going to fall into these same clusters make sense it's kind of fun not only that but by by watching how a student uh, solution as they type it in here move from a correct cluster to an incorrect cluster you can even tell them you went wrong right here right and you could give them immediate feedback patty are you sure that you want to do this right maybe think about it right try this yellow uh, uh, step again right so uh, this is again this is something we don't know why these solutions are correct or incorrect the, the, the algorithm isn't able to understand that uh, but we can at least figure out where the students made a mistake and, uh, and how they made the mistake. So that gives you an idea of how these technologies are, are, are going to be flowing in, helping us scale up, uh, uh, scale up our, our grading in, in this case. So I think I have about 10 minutes. Do I have 10 minutes left? Okay, so let's talk about the, where all this is going and, and, and I think in, in a sense introducing some of these ideas into education it's almost like a Pandora's box has been opened and I think there are some very interesting uh, massive opportunities in the future but there's no question that there are potential unintended consequences right that are might be good and might be bad uh, and and so let's let's just talk about some of these uh, over the next uh, next few minutes okay and and the, the interesting thing when you look at the the what I've been talking about for the last you know a few minutes is that really we can extrapolate from what we've been talking about to how things really might be 10 years or or, or, or 20 years uh, 20 years from now so let's just come back to the idea of data let's, let's finish that off first the really really neat thing about having data uh, lots of data about student learning experiences is not only to think about this innermost feedback loop of providing you know personalized learning pathways for students but thinking about larger scale feedback loops that we have just never just have not been explored before for example this one here basically the idea of being able to use data to improve textbooks and learning materials right if, if you've ever written a textbook you know that you get very very minimal feedback from anyone who's ever used your book very minimal and the time scale is like years so the, the thing now is if you're an author of some educational materials you'll be able to find out almost in real time as people are using your materials what they're finding useful not useful what they're succeeding at what they're not succeeding at you might find that section 5.3.2 in your chemistry textbook is awful right just isn't working for people and that's going to be driven by data and you're going to be able to update that right update that and 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 push it out for even students to use this very same semester people might uh, have heard of Amazon Kindle uh, books people writing novels in Amazon Kindle books now who are actually looking at data provided by Amazon of how people are reading the book where they're stopping where they're coming back to and in some cases changing their story to make the book more engaging fascinating interesting not interesting I mean it's interesting okay and then finally on the on the the, the, the largest scale uh, so little is understood about how people learn and how people forget right most of the studies in cognitive science are are are, are, are pursued in laboratories right with paid participants memorizing English Swahili word pairs right it's very very limited uh, uh, progress has been made we have an opportunity with these kind of systems to conduct trials right even randomized trials on a massive scale right nationwide worldwide so I'm really excited about the progress that can be made in, in the science of and the science of learning well, uh, what else we're in the selfie generation right everybody's doing it these days right so what does that mean well uh, now let's think of these tablets that you're holding in front of you or these computers that you have open in front of you uh, you're studying from it right but it has a camera why is it not studying you right big brother right why is it not studying you and in fact there's a community of people working on extracting just from the front facing camera on your tablet or phone or laptop extracting all kinds of analytics 
Okay, all kinds of analytics to understand all kinds of different things. People are doing it for medical applications. You can get your heart rate, blood perfusion, all kinds of uh, 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 medical uh, what medical data just from from these cameras you can also figure out emotions of people you can figure out uh, uh, other kinds of uh, uh, more psychological aspects and in fact there's been work done that shows learning is that you're really learning something when you kind of have a weird kind of puzzle face so imagine the difficulty of the problems being tuned you know until you're not smiling anymore right while you're doing your homework Okay, is this, is this awesome? It's totally awesome. Is this scary? Totally scary, right? Totally scary. But it's going to happen, right? Something like this is going to happen. This raises very interesting and thorny privacy issues, right? Not just in college, where students can opt into this. K-12, this is, there's FERPA, there's all kinds of regulations around this. But if you're going to do any of this stuff in personalized learning, right, you have to have data. So, so you're going to have privacy issues. Who's going to control the electronic learning record? I like to call it this, right? So a student is no longer just going to have a transcript. They're going to have a record of everything, right? From K to 20, right? Uh, every problem they worked, right? Are you going to interview at Google? And is Google going to say, wow, you know, you did you didn't quite get that bubble sort problem, right? Uh, correct in short enough time. So, you know, I'm sorry. What are we going to do about people who have a pre-existing learning condition, right? Can never be a faculty member, right? Or, or maybe they're, you know, I don't know, destined to be a faculty member. So, this, uh, they're very interesting questions around privacy and, and around data. Okay, so let's talk about uh, uh, some breaking news, right? Uh, uh, that that uh, Hillary Clinton's campaign has announced they figured this out that we're going to solve the privacy issue by have every student's going to have their own electronic data server, right? Uh, and, uh, okay, no, no laughs. Okay, so next, let's talk about economics. I could put in a Ted Cruz joke, right? It's, it's embarrassing that Ted Cruz's uh, campaign office is literally a mile from our OpenStax offices. So, uh, I, I, yeah, I shouldn't even bring that up here. Okay, uh, so let's talk about ec economics and business models. So textbooks, uh, education, uh, it's been around for hundreds of years, right? This is, uh, we, we, we've hit the, 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 the sort of summit of, of the way things should really be organized. But really, is there any difference between the business of, of books and learning, right? And, and we, we all, as faculty, we should not forget that we're part of an industry, even though we don't like to think of it that way, right? There's, and we work at non profit usually uh, institutions right that, that work in, in in an industry and why is our industry going to be any different than these industries and these industries were destroyed by information technology and remade in entirely new ways right uh, that were somehow better right but uh, Many of the people involved in the earlier uh, instantiation of these industries were right sort of sent sent away right so how is it how 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 is what's going on here going to impact learning and, and and if you think of openness and just this idea of open networks for content and ideas there's 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 two hallmarks and two big words right uh, one is disintermediation or craigslistization right just go straight to the cut out the middleman and the second is disaggregation the idea you, that if you break up some kind of business uh, in the littler pieces, you can get economies of scale or, or just new efficiencies through uh, specialization. So let's talk about uh, talk about these. So disintermediation is is you, know, you think oh well uh, uh, you know the, the w w our institutions are, are are how students get degrees right and our books are how students are going to learn and our teaching is how students are going to get the information they're going to need to get the degree. But increasingly, we're finding startups right that are, are trying to literally Craigslistize the whole uh, uh, college experience where you can sign up, for example, at University of the People, you can take courses for free, the materials are free, and they will give you a degree after four years, right? And the only cost to you is a very minimal cost for proctoring some exams, right? And this is completely outside of the Right, standard educational world that, that we live in. We laugh at this kind of thing right now, right? Ha 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 ha. 
we laugh from our, uh, uh, our heights. But we used to laugh about University of Phoenix. Right? Oh, University of Phoenix, that's not... Well, it is, a, you know, this is a, it is a force to be reckoned with today. So it could easily be that some of these actually catch on. We could even move into a world where the actual degrees in some technical fields are actually credentialed by big companies. If you're going to want to work for Google or Microsoft, maybe you'll take the Google Microsoft final exam that makes you a computer scientist. Again, this could completely go around our, our industry. Second, disaggregation, right? As I mentioned at the, at the beginning, uh, uh, universities are factories, right, that create graduates. Uh, why do we think that all of the functions that go on at a university have to stay controlled centrally? And why won't they maybe be split up and different elements handled by different bodies, right? Why God, this, this could easily uh, happen? Interesting, uh, edX, right? edX announced that Arizona State University is going to offer all the courses needed for a, all, for a first year of university for free, right? Show of hands, people know about this, okay, very interesting, right? Threatened, who feels threatened? Okay, who, who does, okay, good, okay. Uh, so I, I find this just very, very, very interesting. We could move into a world, it, it, it maybe a bit dystopian, but where a Rice computer science major is taking databases from Stanford, right, and they're taking their programming languages from Carnegie Mellon, Rice might still be stamping the degree, but all of the functions of the uh, uh, the, 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 the teaching and learning may be, may be disaggregated. Of course, you know, ev uh, edX, everybody knows about MOOCs. Show of, I just show of hands, who hasn't heard of MOOCs? We got into a hysteria about MOOCs, right? They're going to take all our jobs. Uh, we're done for, right? Uh, I think the good news, right, the good news for, for people who like to, is, is that, you know, there's a, there's a standard curve uh, uh, around how new technologies are, are, are sort of hyped and then uh, uh, they go through this incredible hype and, and then they go down to the peak of dis disillusionment and we are definitely headed that way with MOOCs, right? If I was here two years ago, right, everyone would be in a tizzy, but I think now people are realizing that, you know, there's some utility here, the hype, they're not worth the hype uh, and, and sort of time will tell how high we're going to climb, right, and hopefully we'll get to some kind of plateau of productivity because there's no question, right, there's no question that there's going to be a convergence, right, of everything digital is somehow going to come together, right. When we talk about di the idea of digital textbooks, right, digital courses, Khan Academy video libraries or YouTube lecturing, all of the, these, what, what today seem disparate, like a course is not a book, right, is not a video, all of these, uh, not an LMS, right? All of these ideas are going to come together into one thing. And I don't know what it's going to be called. Digital learning platform, right? Uh, uh, and this is going to happen over the next 10 years or so. And, and the interesting thing will just be whether these platforms are controlled by for-profit entities like the publishers, whether they get it, or non-profit entities like uh, universities and uh, uh, edX, for example, providers like them, or Khan Academy, or whether entirely new institutions emerge, right? But I think this is a very interesting you know, space to be, uh, to be working in right now. Okay, so I will end. Uh, uh, hopefully this has uh, sort of uh, made you think about uh, some things. What I've really tried to do is, is think a little, uh, and think and talk a little bit about how we've tried to scale up the kind of education that, that, that goes on at our campuses uh, through th rethinking the material side, rethinking how we can use technology like uh, machine learning, uh, and also thinking about how we can uh, think about platforms uh, for the future. I'm also really, really excited about how we can use uh, data to help us invent you know, truly entirely new ways to, to teach uh, and learn. And I guess I'll end there, so thank you very much. Do we have time for any questions or did I? Okay, so any questions, comments? You just don't agree. You get the prize for that, actually.
Yeah, and, okay, did everybody hear the question? Yeah, uh, the question was, now I'm going to butcher it probably, but it's an excellent question. The question is, uh, well, it's, it's a whole host of questions one, uh, or, or ideas. One is, the ideas that I talked about were mainly about solving a physics problem, right? That's not about becoming a physicist and, and, and the deeper understanding of the problem solving process and, 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 and all of that. Uh, and the question then is, you know, it, it could, it could machine learning algorithms help in that direction or is that really where people, right, faculty are really required? So uh, I, that's, that's a, a really good question. I, I would answer that in, uh, with a couple points. The first is you're absolutely right that the technology for education is focused primarily on really just these low level kind of skills almost, right? The skills required to do calculus, to solve physics problems, to think about writing an essay, right? And, uh, the, the, uh, and, and they've been reasonably successful. Uh, I would say that means that in today's world, people are absolutely essential, right? Uh, to, to not only help with these higher level skill, higher level, so for, for example, thinking and, and critical thinking and problem solving skills, but also interpreting what happens when the algorithms go wrong, right? So I think people are very, very important and I think it's hard to imagine, uh, I don't view the kind of things we're working on as being adversarial to teachers or trying to replace the teacher. Uh, all that said, over time, it, it, you know, increasingly, machine tools are going to be more and more useful for helping students with higher and higher level tasks. Uh, and so I, it's very hard to think like about what's going to happen 50 years from now. I think we're all v rather uh, uh, safe, right, for these, these higher level uh, 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 thought processes, but I think that there, there is a, a lot of people interested in more, less the machine learning side and more the artificial intelligence side of things, trying to create more and more uh, uh, complex systems to be able to help with those higher level ideas. Does that, does that help answer? Yeah. Yes. Um, you talk a lot about first lines. Sure. Oh, interesting, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So group work, right? This is personalized learning, but people learn better in a group, so it's kind of at odds, right? And, and personally, this is a, a, an area I'm very interested in because when I teach at Rice, students are assigned to a study group and they have to do their homeworks not alone but with their group because they learn better. So how does that, you know, when, when Johnny and Patty are looking at their homework and it's different, how are they going to work together, right? So we're very interested in how, I think some of the ideas that we talked about can be a, a sort of taken to this higher level that you could imagine, uh, 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 you know, developing the uh, uh, group personal or group specific next tasks. Right? Your study group should do this next, should do this problem. And it could be that those problems are selected because it might help one of the members of the team. Right? Maybe they really need it and maybe another member of the team is selected to help tutor them on that idea right? so that they can get help get that problem correct. Does that make sense? Uh, we're also really interested in some of these ideas for group formation because it turns out that students usually do not form optimal study groups. They just don't, right? Uh, and and there's a, uh, you can actually learn a lot from uh, just uh, uh, st how students have performed and the kind of performance in previous classes to form groups for future classes. We've written a few pa papers in this direction. Also in the direction of peer using peer grading. Peer grading is really a hot idea right now. The idea of uh, having students grade each other's work, right? Uh, we've been able to identify very interesting patterns in peer grading networks. We have a, a, a project with Arizona State University where we were actually able to identify all kinds of interesting things in a, in a, a particular class, including who was, who was probably dating who in the class. So you can learn a lot using data uh, to, to improve the, the interpersonal interactions. But that, that's a really, really interesting area. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Sure. And, and, and then yes.
Oh, it, very interesting. Okay, did everybody hear that? What's the danger of, well, people in the back don't care. So let's, because you're sitting in the back, right? You don't care. Anyway, that's a great question. What, if we introduce machine algorithms, in, even into, I will, I will actually broaden it. Not just knowledge creation, but knowledge uh, selection. Patty, here's what you should do next. There are uh, incredible dangers. There are incredible dangers here. Uh, because, uh, and and the, the examples of this already exist, not in the education space, but in the news space, right? Because in the old days, you had three choices to get news. The CBS News, the NBC News, or the ABC News. And they were, because they were broadcast, they had to kind of be broad. And they had to kind of cover all angles because they had to have stuff for conservatives and stuff for liberals, right? And sort of, one, now that we've moved to electronic, right? And, and cable where you have hundreds of channels, what's happened, right? Fox News people only watch Fox News, right? CNN people only watch CNN. They have different viewpoints. And, they're, and, and, and if, if you get your news from these news feeders, that basically feed you news based on what you liked in the past, uh, this is, there's a known effect that if you start to go more conservative or more liberal, you will get fed stuff that is more and more conservative and more and more liberal, even though you might not be that kind of person, right? And so there's a real danger for civil society with this, and I think there's a real danger uh, for education that you could have somebody like, my God, I didn't want to be a physicist, but suddenly, you know, I got more and more physics stuff sent towards me, <laughs> right? Or, or uh, so, so uh, yeah, I think this is a very dangerous uh, possibility, and this is, again, where humans could help, right? Uh, but we need to somehow, go, yeah, guard against this. That, that's a really good, that's a really good question. This has been studied, right, in, in, the, in the political science world. Anybody remember what it's called? It has a name. The filter zone, filter bubble, filter bubble. Yeah, you live in this bubble because you're, right, information filter. Yeah, question. Um, I was fascinated by your intelligent brain. Sure. Massive barrier. So let, let, let's split. Yeah, let's split your quick because that. Yeah, this is a huge. This is a just. It's a. It's a nightmare, right? And this is again why people go to multiple choice because clicking is really easy. There's a just a. It's probably going to take a decade, right? But but force. I force my students because I want the data, right? I force my students to type in for about half of their assignment problems these. Type it in, right? Uh, uh, their response, either in something like LaTeX or th there's all these different ways you can type in math, right? Uh, and they hate it. They hate it. They hate it. They hate it, right? And and I'm willing to take the hit on my teaching evaluations, right? But this is this is a big this is a big problem in an area like computer science where you're coding. This is perfect because you're typing in your program. So, uh, but yeah, for other areas, it, it, or essays, you're going to be typing it in. But for anything with math, it's, it's still, we're a decade off, yeah. Chemical diagrams, yeah, yeah. But there, there's a lot of progress, but it's just too slow, too slow. Right. So that, uh, everybody hear the question? So the question is, 
limitations of computer grading and, and it, uh, what, uh, there are many examples, for example, using natural language processing for essay grading where fac some faculty are super happy with it. Other faculty say, watch, I'll type in total gibberish with a bunch of really big words, right? Uh, and complicated sentence structures and I'll get an awesome grade, right? So it's clearly missing something. So uh, your, your point in question is, is right on that I would, first of all, I would view these as useful tools, but they're just a tool and they're nowhere near, uh, you know, this is kind of the future, right? That in 10 years, these things will be even, you know, I think really uh, uh, ready for prime time, but today there's, there's all kinds of ways that they can be, uh, that they can be fooled, for example. Uh, for example, if you took the, the mathematical, uh, you know, the, our mathematical grading that I talked about. If you take those steps and you scramble the order of the steps so that the student started with the right answer and went back, you know, in some random thing and ended up with, with where they started, you would get the exact same grade. Right? That's obviously wrong, right? And, and people in machine learning study this, for example, for face recognition systems, for example. There's a lot of interest right now in using the, the so-called deep learning systems for face recognition that are that are have superhuman capabilities they can recognize faces better than people can now except that you could put a completely bizarre looking random picture in front of the system and it will say that it is Richard Baranek right so they can be fooled and so I think this uh, this sort of uh, it's not really a Turing test but this idea of, of creating systems that, that, that can't be fooled as easily is a really important, important goal, right? The good news, though, is that students who sit, usually students who sit down to write an essay are trying to write an actual essay and not a gibberish thing. <laughs> and so the, it, like what you would say in, in, in probability theory is the, you'd like the, the, the set of, of, of gibberish nonsense that gets good grades to be a very small set. Right? You'd like that, right? <laughs>